All right, and welcome back to the Motivating Force podcast. I am host Sway, and joining me as always, we have the wonderful Justin. So today we're going to be talking about Confucius, one of the men that influenced greatly the Bushido. And we're going to talk about that uh, very, very briefly. Uh, we're going to have some callbacks to that. So if you haven't seen the uh, way to apply the Bushido code and live your life like a samurai, we have an episode on that a couple weeks ago. Go ahead and check that out because like I said, we're going to have a couple callbacks. But to briefly tell you what that is, is that the Bushido is the code of conduct upheld by the samurai of ancient Japan. Uh, it was heavily influenced by Confucianism, so now we're going to be talking about Confucius himself, his life, his teachings, his philosophy, basically how to uh, apply the things that he had in his life nowadays. Now, Confucius was a uh, super influential person, so it's uh, definitely going to be an interesting conversation, um, especially knowing the when, when you really dive deep in the information here, this is going to get to the exciting point where you think about when he had these ideas and then you think about the ideology of man today being, I mean, 2,000, almost 2,500 years later. It's exciting. Yeah. It's exciting. And that's a great point that you brought up because I wanted to emphasize on the importance of understanding when he was alive. And it was in 551 to 479 BCE. So that was a very, very long time ago, right? Uh, he was a Chinese philosopher and a politician. So now this is where you go, oh, he was a politician. So he was corrupt and he was a bad guy, right? But then remember, democracy and the way of life that we have now that we've accustomed to, even after the turn of the millennia, even, even in 1000 AD, like the type of government that we had then was completely different than the type of government that he was raised in. So he was widely considered one of the most inf important and influential people in human history, like Justin stated. Confucius's teachings and philosophy formed the basis of East Asian culture and society and continue to remain influential across China and East Asia today. One of the famous teachings Confucianism developed uh, which would later be described as a tradition, a philosophy, a religion, a humanistic or rationalistic religion, a way of governing, or simply a way of life. Confucianism emphasized personal and governmental morality, which is key because we seem to lack that today. Uh, correctness of social relationships, justice, kindness, and sincerity. Confucianism was part of the Chinese social fabric. So already with what I've said, you can see where it ties in with the codes, with, with the different um, moral codes that the Bushido has, the rectitude and justice, the character traits, all these things are very, they're, they're heavily based on Confucianism. And remember that um, uh, the Bushido itself was developed probably 1,500 years later. And then quickly, a fun fact, he, well, he adopted a well-known a uh, principle which is do not do unto others what you do not want done to yourself which is quote unquote the golden rule and dumbed down to be do unto others as you want done to yourself it's just a uh, yeah it's interesting seeing the shift here with uh confucianism right of the the chinese culture okay and how those were implemented into the japanese culture today Correct. Because, I mean, today the Japanese and the Chinese didn't really get along, right? So um, it's interesting seeing that type of, of mixture and cultures there, and especially when you compare the um, standard, like, morality between, like, the differences between the two countries today. And, I mean, I feel I can say that because that's not even a bad thing to say against China because Japan is just, like, super high up on the moral chart. They beat, yeah. a, they beat a lot of people, so yeah. it's not much to say uh, as far as that goes. But to take these teachings and adapt them to yourself, to your culture, to your time, and let it be successful and prosperous. And we can see that that's what's happening in Japan with it, right? And it's the same thing today where... We see a lot of those flaws where we take these old ideologies, these uh, older people like Confucius, like Buddha, and we go, oh, none of that applies to us anymore because it's a different time frame. 
all you have to do is take it and apply it to yourself. Yeah. You know, and let it be successful. And make the adaptations, make the changes that need to be made. Yeah. But that's a rant for another day. Well, no, it could even be for today because there's a lot of what you said that I'm going to be talking about. And one of the first things is going to be, how did Japan get so influenced by a Chinese teacher and a philosopher, right? When you think of Japan, it's this island nation that was super segregated and it was super just apart from the rest of the world because, like I said, it's an island nation, you know? It's it's not on a major la- landmass. Mm-hmm. So then, obviously, throughout, um, towards the end of his life, his teachings, I'm going to talk about it, were made into analects. So then they were kind of crossing uh, via... Um, like trade routes and all that to the island they would send over books and and teachings and that's how it kind of uh, grew in its uh, cultural sense in japan and i think that's one of the reasons why japan still upholds a lot of those teachings because it's so far away it's not connected to the other things like china now is completely different i'm not saying it's a good thing but the way that japan was separated it was probably the main reason why they were able to uphold these rules, right? So then now, like what you're saying about how we can't uphold these rules now or these virtues, Confucius's teachings is all about not following it as a set of rules. Like you don't have to take this this constitution basically and do every step as it says. I'm going to talk about that right now. Uh, one of the deepest teachings that Confucius may have had, um, superiority of personal ex- exemplification over explicit rules of behavior, his moral teachings emphasize self cultivation emulation of moral exemplars, and the attainment of skilled judgment rather than knowledge of the rules. So it's one thing to be where we just think of the rules and we have to follow them because now like, we're always repeating them, we always have to uphold them. But then going, okay, I understand what the guidelines say, but sometimes those boundaries have to be crossed. Sometimes I have to step out. And then again, he also explains why. Confucian ethics may therefore be considered a type of virtue ethics. His teachings required examination and context to be understood, right? So that's what I'm saying. You have to fully understand it to then go, okay, maybe I should follow this one now, maybe not follow it later in this scenario. Uh, but a good example, um, he, he gave an anecdote when there were these stables that burnt down um, from returning from like a court that he was he was having like a little meeting with town people. Um, the stables were burning down. And the first thing he said was, was anyone hurt? Right. He didn't ask about the horses. He asked if anybody's lo- like any person was hurt. And by not asking about the horses, Confucius demonstrates that his, he values human beings over property. Right. Readers are led to reflect on whether their response would follow Confucius's and to pursue self-improvement or it would not have, right? So either you go, okay, the stable burned down. Did anybody get hurt? So you can understand that he values human life more than, you know, horses or the property itself. And it's like, you can either have those two thoughts in your head. Either, oh my God, everything's ruined. Or, hey, is anybody hurt? No? Okay, then we're good. Yeah. You know, let's focus on the most important thing at hand. If you're good, I mean, he's thinking ethically, logically. You know, if everybody else is good, why are we spending so much time freaking out about the other things? And, and little examples like that that you can kind of twist and turn for your own little examples to understand that, you know, if nobody is at risk, why are you wasting so much time worrying about it? Yeah, and it's funny, too, because it reminds me of, like, You know, in the movies where the guy's car is on fire or, you know, the money explodes and it's all burning to the ground. It's raining, you know, money, destroyed money. And they're on the ground. They're screaming, ah, right? And uh, it's just always so funny, you know. They make it so dramatic. And it's like none of that stuff matters, man. I've always found it hilarious seeing those scenes in movies because it's like being the bad guy, you know, like you that's what you get. Right. That's what you get for caring about stuff that just doesn't really matter. Yeah. But it's also a thought of the people that are watching that movie. What's the first thing you think of? Do you go, oh, man, all that money's now burned. Or do you go, well, the good guy or the bad guy, you know, they're still alive. Like it's it's the, the thought process that you quickly go to. And that's why like Confucius serves not as an all powerful deity, as in like 
Buddha or, or Muhammad or, or Moses in different religions um, or universally true set of abstract principles, but rather the ultimate model for others. So it's like to virtuous, um, like the virtues that you go to. Um, for these reasons, according to many commentators, Confucius's teachings may be considered a Chinese example of humanism, which is another form of philosophy that people can think of and apply to their life as well. Uh, often overlooked Confucian ethics are the virtues to the self, so sincerity and the cultivation of knowledge, which, I mean, we talk about all the time, seeking knowledge for wanting to grow and, and learning. A virtuous action towards others begins with virtuous and sincere thought, which begins with knowledge. A virtuous disposition without knowledge is susceptible to corruption, and virtuous action without sincerity is not true righteousness. Cultivating knowledge and sincerity is also important for one's own sake. The superior person loves learning for the sake of learning and righteousness for the sake of righteousness. Now, like I said, if you've watched the episode on the Bushido and the different steps that is in that, you're going to go, oh, that sounds familiar. Right. So this is where the first callback to the Bushido comes from. So the rectitude and justice point of the, of the Bushido code uh, which is when I gave the example, a well-known samurai defines rectitude as one's power to decide upon a course of conduct in accordance with reason, without wavering, to die when to die is right, and to strike when to strike is right, right? So then you're doing things for the right reason. You're not doing it to get your own personal gain from it. You're not putting on a fake mask to just try to seem like you're doing the right thing because you're going to get brownie points from the person or because they're going to give you something that you've been wanting. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do. It's interesting how that works with our reward system when you really think about it, because, you know, that, that is a really good point where if you seek knowledge for the sake of seeking knowledge, you're going to get a lot of fulfillment from that. And you're, you're going to, of course, find a lot of knowledge. But if you're seeking knowledge with uh, external intentions, you know, um, albeit good or bad, doesn't really matter. But for any other reason than the fact of gaining knowledge, it's going to be a hard time for you and it won't be as fulfilling. So it's interesting how all that works. And you can see here where, you know, even talking 500 BCE, right, it's this long ago, human nature is what it is. That's not something that's going to really change anytime soon. And uh, over the course of human history, people get glimpses of certain aspects of human nature and they can figure it out. And then that's how you get people like Confucius. That's how you get people like Buddha and, and Moses and Muhammad and whatnot, is they get that glimpse of what the core true human nature is. And they get to spell it out as simply as possible for people and become the next great thing. Yeah. Well, it, they become the next great thing because they understand the good and the bad sides of it. Because human nature is going to be what human nature is, good or bad, as we talked about on Monday's episode. But that's why, you know, we, we have to apply these kind of thoughts in our life now. So it's not that you're doing the exact example that he has. It's not when, you know, you happen to go across the countryside and you see a stable that's burning. You don't go, oh, oh, you know, is anyone hurt? Yeah. No, come on, guy. Or you're not um, doing something good just to get those brownie points, like I said. You're doing, you're, you're just applying these thoughts and, and the way that he kind of breaks everything down in layman's terms for everybody to apply it to your life so then you are seeking a more structured lifestyle. You are seeking a better understanding of what it means to be human and to reach your true potential. And that's the importance of understanding our past, understanding the people that did have a good grasp on this thought and wrote it out for everybody. You know, there's a reason why it, st it stood the test of time. Um, and in the early Confucian tradition, Li, L and then I with a little squiggly thing on top, uh, was doing the proper thing at the proper time, balancing between maintaining existing norms to perpetrate an ethical social fabric and violating them in order to accomplish an ethical good. And that's something that we see a lot of people are scared of doing now in the times that we have our current society. There's so many people that are afraid to get shunned, are afraid to lose their livelihood, to stand out against these things because our social fabric 
says that we all have to be a certain way now. So it's, it's very few and far in between to find people that are willing to speak out about certain issues, certain topics. It could be little things and they won't talk about it because of fear. They're not talking about it because they don't believe it's right. They're just afraid to speak out about it. And that's the dangerous thing. I mean, that is super dangerous. And we uh, now more than a time now more than any other time. Can we call that present in at least in our country in the United States? Right. With the whole issue going on where we have the thought police, the social justice warriors, all these different things. You think something's right, something's wrong, and you are afraid to express that opinion because if you're wrong about that opinion, you're going to get crucified for it. And then we understand what an opinion is. And that's the reason why it's your opinion, because you have the right to be wrong. Right. You have the right to make mistakes and to mess up and to be a human and to be able to express those thoughts, have somebody more knowledgeable on the topic than you come along, explain it to you. Hell, maybe even have that informational argument with you and get you to see it the right way or learn from it or vice versa where you're the one doing that. That's the exchange of information. That's how it works. If you're afraid to express those points at all to the point where you're not expressing those points anymore, how are people expected to grow and learn? Right. And that's a fantastic point that you brought up. And if you're not aware of what the thought police is um, and you're you're thinking the same way, you, you understand what we're saying to an extent, uh, feel free to, you know, gain some more knowledge and read up on the book 1984 by George Orwell or his other book. Uh, I believe it's Animal Farm. The same thing. If you want to see the dangers that this society could lead to, if we continue on being afraid of speaking out or speaking, just giving opinions, giving your thoughts, you know, putting it out on the world, having discussions with other human beings. We're not saying that you're going to be right all the time. Just have the courage to have your own thought processes when you want to stand up for what you think is ethically correct. Read up on those books. I'm sure we'll also talk about them later on, but that way you can know what we're talking about. Uh, but back to this, Lee is linked to the core value of Ren. Ren consists of five basic virtues, seriousness, generosity, sincerity, diligence, and kindness. Ren is the virtue of perfectly fulfilling one's responsibilities towards others, most often translated as benevolence or humanness. Again, back to the Bushido, benevolence was one of the core principles that you follow along that code of conduct. You can see how it was already, I've stated multiple things that if you have seen that video, you can see how it all ties together. How this one person has influenced this giant cultural code of conduct so greatly. And Confucius' moral system was based upon empathy and understanding others rather than divinely ordained rules. So the drastic difference between him and a dictator is that he's not saying, I am God, and this is all the things you have to do. It's, hey, I'm a person, and I'm going to give out these kind of guidelines of how you should treat other people. Don't be a douchebag, basically. (laughs) That sums it up well. Right? It's kind of like on the point. Yeah, right on the money. (laughs) Yeah, and then now to explain a little bit more on how he was a politician, right? So Confucius's political thought is based upon his ethical thought, so... It's not like he had a complete change of heart and was like, I'm a politician now. I'm going to be a douche. He argued that the best government is one that rules through rights, which is Lee, right? The ethical uh, points that I was just giving and people's natural morality, not by using bribery or coercion, right? So like I just said about the dictators and how they would persuade the society to believe after generations and generations that they are this deity, that they are this God that you have to uh, give what 90% of whatever you make or 90% of whatever you farm or or cultivate is now to that god right that's not how you maintain a government he explained that this is one of the most important analects if the people are led by laws and uniformity sought to be given 
them by punishments, they will try to avoid the punishment but have no sense of shame. So they're only following the rules just not to get punished, right? So, I mean, the same way if you're a parent and you raise your kids, don't try to always go, oh, I'm going to hit you if you don't do this. Or if you don't clean your room, then, you know, you're not going to have playtime or screen time or whatever the case. You have to um, lead by virtue and uniformity sought to be given to them by the cell, by the rules of property or propriety. Sorry. They will have the sense of shame and moreover will become good. So if you give them another reason to do it, like, hey, cleaning your room is going to build the discipline. It's going to build um, habit. It's going to give you a clean um, thought process every time you go into your room. Like give him more of an understanding or give your kids more of an understanding of why they're doing it is going to be beneficial for them. Don't just make them afraid to not do it because then this way they understand what's going to happen if they don't do it, but then they will appreciate why they are doing it. Same goes for government. Especially when you start applying real reasons to it, right? Like telling them, you know, okay, well, clean your room or else you're going to get the belt. Or it's, hey, clean your room because if not, eventually you're going to get roaches in here. And what happens if you get roaches in your room? Nobody likes that shit. Yeah. Nobody likes yeah. that, right? And <laughs> it's like you give them the real reasons with it because, I mean, we see this with, you know, the sheltered kids who, who get to go to college. We see this with the helicopter parenting and the strict parents and when those kids uh, move out of the house and they realize like, oh my God, I can leave this cup off of this coaster and my dad's not going to come flying around the corner with a belt. Yeah. That's where that cup stays now. Yeah. You know, and it's like, they're going to they constantly push that boundary. Yeah. If you're, if you're ruling with that dictatorship mentality and, and ruling by that fear and that punishment, you're not building core values. Yeah. You're not building thought process. Yeah. You're really not. They're going to do things fear-driven. That's it. End of story. There's no thought behind it. They're not thinking for themselves at that point. And then that's what we have in society. That's the issues we see today. But in the same sense, that's why he also mentioned bribery. So bribery and coercion. Coercion. Um, and I'm not afraid to say it. We see it with spoiled children, right? So if you always go, hey, clean your room and you'll get ice cream, sooner or later, you're going to be tired of getting them ice cream and they're going to put up a fit because they cleaned the room for something and you're not able to give it to them. So then what do you get? You get a spoiled kid that's going to apply that to every little example that you give them. Yeah. But the same way, you know, bigger picture, you look at government. Government does the same thing. Society's going to start re um, being spoiled towards the person and whoever's in power or whatever structure that is in power. Yeah. Wear a mask and stay home. Oh, you don't like that? You like 1400 bucks? There you go. <laughs> I wonder what that's about. Anyway. I have no idea. Um, Confucius looked nostalgically upon earlier days and urged the Chinese, particularly those with political power, to model themselves on earlier examples. In times of division, chaos, and endless war between feudal states, uh, he wanted to restore the mandate of heaven that could unify the world. And it was a character that meant all under heaven, because obviously he's not writing this in English. Uh, they write in characters. Um, and bestow peace and prosperity on the people. So obviously, you know, we're even looking at it now, 2,500 years in the future from his time, that this man is urging his political structure to look at the past. So we can constantly, like, apply that now. Always learn from your past. Look back. What is the world done wrong? What has the world done good? Apply those changes to what we're doing now. Don't fall into the trap of repeating what has already happened. It's in the past, so we should learn from it. Why can't people do that now? But that's the reason why you're here today, hopefully. You're trying to grow. You're not trying to fall back to what you were before. So that's why I wanted to like really emphasize the importance of how he said that as a polit like that was his political view, you know? Urging the people that had power to not fall back on what they were before because sooner or later you're just going to be um division again there's going to be endless chaos and endless wars between all these different states you don't want that if we're all striving towards quote-unquote world peace 
how are we going to get there if we fear looking back? If we start hiding history, if we start erasing history, I mean, we start taking down statues, we start uh, banning certain books from being in libraries, in schools. How are we going to learn from that? We're going er, to we're going to increase the the curiosity of those to come, the generations to come, to want to seek that, because we're going. Oh, you don't need to know about that. But then they're going to go. Oh, are you just hiding that? Maybe now I want to see what it is. Instead of teaching them why it was bad to begin with. Yeah. I mean, hopefully then that's the blessing in disguise, you know, is them actually seeking out the past since we do uh, so much to censor it and hide it nowadays. Just hopefully there's enough of it there that they can find the, the truth, you know. But then that's up to the individual's perspective, because what if they had a terrible upbringing? They get that curiosity. They don't know that it was a bad thing. They just go, oh, we weren't supposed to learn about it. Let me find out more. And then it turns into another Hitler It turns into another Stalin. You know, that's the danger in not telling them what has happened in the past. Yeah, but collectively, though, you know, collectively seeking out the wisdom of the past, you know. um, I mean, we do it today. That's why we see, you know, the the big movements with Stoicism. We see the big movements with just all kinds of different philosophies. And and that time's going to go away. But it'll reemerge again in the future and come back. Hopefully, so that's having a very hopefully. But it's the same. It's the same cycles that we see, and it's but, the same things that we want to see moving forward. Well, hold up, because that's a very optimistic way of looking at the world. And you know, I congratulate you for finally thinking that way. But what about the way the Mayans kind of just got wiped from the earth? There's no like way to learn more about their civilization than pretty much what we know now, right? So if you were to do the same thing, let's think 20 generations from now are going to look back at uh, the Nazi revolutions, the the Stalin dictatorship, right? If we kind of just destroy all of that evidence now, if it's all erased from our history, there's no way for them to know. Like they're kind of just piecing things together and might they might just find the good things in it. I'm not saying, you know, that they're going to start thinking that that's a good way of life but there's the danger that it could kind of yeah turn into that i mean history is doomed to repeat itself if you don't learn from it so of course um the more you censor the more you hide the more those things come to flourishing again yeah and um yeah i mean that's why of course with what we're talking about today confucius smart man it's all about looking at that past and the more important thing about pulling from that is getting to the point in your life where things that you do, things you put your energy towards don't necessarily need a reward. Yeah. You should do certain things from time to time, right? That's just for the sake of goodness. Right. And when we can do that, especially when our politicians can do that, can we move forward as a society and become a really great place? Amen. But let's let's wrap up real quick so we can all get out of here and continue with your day, uh, your goals that you have for yourself. So Confucius's teachings were later turned into an elaborate set of rules and practices by his numerous disciples and followers who organized his teachings into the Analects. So back with how I was telling you that, you know, those trade routes to Japan and stuff, that's how they kind of got these teachings and these these ways of life, these ethics and virtues over to Japan. And I think that's one of the um perks of being that island nation is that you know then all of this other chaos started ensuing on the mainland they weren't really affected by it you know so japan could have held on to these analects and then it kind of evolved into the bushido which was a great thing and hopefully something that we can apply to our lives now on the western civilization in america and hopefully all over the world confucius's disciples and his only grandson zc continued his philosophy philosophical school after his death so that's a plus right we get to hear about him today 2500 years in the future and we're still learning more and more because of the sake of knowledge and learning so hopefully like justin was saying when you're seeking knowledge for the sake of knowledge you retain more you understand it better you get to apply it in your life but when you're seeking it just to get the upper hand on somebody or you're seeking it just to get like that that trick up your sleeve you're not going to retain the knowledge as it's given to you, as it's intended. 
So hopefully you guys stick around. More videos to come. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed everything that we've been giving so far. And you can let us know by likes, comments, uh, subscribing to the page, hitting that bell icon. You can also, if you're listening to the audio only, you can give us a rating on any platform you're listening to us to. You can also give us a comment on that rating and it would help a lot. We would be able to um, kind of do the little changes needed to help everybody fully understand the, the points that we're giving to you. If there's little tricks that we can be doing for certain people, we'd love to know them so that we can get a bigger audience and, and kind of help them understand how to build a structured lifestyle and, and better their, their life for everybody. And with that, you can also send us a message directly if you don't feel like leaving a comment, making it public. We are on Facebook. We are on Instagram. We do accept and read all DMs and messages we get on those uh, social media platforms. So if you have anything uh, you'd like to say to us personally, um, any even topics you want us to share our viewpoints with, we are more than willing to do that. And uh, we would love to have you guys, you know, as being a part of this community, um, just love having you guys be involved uh, we do drop new episodes every monday and wednesday at 8 a.m and until next time go on and get it.